All right, back in John 4 uh, today. <clears throat> We're going to, Lord willing, plan is to just keep going in the narrative analysis, uh, particularly the, the scene analysis. That's what our focus um, was on last time we met, which was a couple weeks ago. And so uh, this, this time I want to dig deeper into that, the scene analysis. We, uh, last time we met, we divided the story into the various scenes and some discussions on that. And there's some, some um, other elements in this story that make it uh, interesting in trying to determine the, the scenes, particularly in the dialogue with the disciples. So we talked about that last time. And, and this is what we came up with is um, basically an introduction and then three scenes in this story. The introduction really gives us the setting for the scene. And as often when we see in the Gospels, you see a transition from a previous story to the next. At the end of this story, John offers a transition from this story to the next one at the end of the chapter. Um, and so he'll introduce it with, a with the setting. That's what he does here in verse 1 to 6. And then we have the first scene where he is at the well speaking with the woman, verses 7 to 26. And then the next scene, the disciples come along, the woman leaves, and he has a discussion with them. And as we talked about last time, we, we sort of had two options there with that, where we could divide this scene to into, into two separate scenes if we wanted, because one was the woman going off to tell the rest in the in the city or in the village about uh, that she'd seen the Messiah. And then, the, of course, Jesus' discussion with them. But it seems like verse 27 um, was introducing the scene. And then, um, as we talked about, sort of this cut scene or, or side event that was meant to, by John to be used to inform uh, what was happening or what was going to be said by Jesus a little bit later in the main scene. So you could take it both ways, but... Uh, uh, I think we we looked at just considering that scene two as all one scene with a sort of a cut scene or uh, side information being given to help us understand the scene as a whole. And then the last uh, scene was the where the other people from the village had come, and now Jesus interacted with them. And really, as you look at the story, and this is why I believe three scenes make the most sense to to identify it that way is because we really these scenes are framed around three conversations, in my view. We have the conversation that's primarily between Jesus and the woman. Then there's the conversation that's primarily between Jesus and the disciples. And then we finally have the scene of, or the conversation or interaction, oops, sorry, interaction with Jesus and the people of Sukkar. Now that there's not a lot of dialogue there. It's really the final response of the people of Sukkar. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there seems to be a particular focus in these three, uh, by these three scenes. Jesus and the woman, Jesus and the disciples, and then Jesus and the people of Sukkar. And so I, I think uh, it makes sense to look at the story uh, this way with these prim three primary scenes. And so now what we want to do is really turn our attention to uh, the scene analysis, the third step, which is now, um, and this is the more involved step, once we've identified the scenes in the story, is now to look at each scene uh, in particular and look for particular aspects within the scene. Again, this is a way to sort of break down the scene, look for details, but do so in a in a formatted way where it's not just random, but we are looking for specific things that will help us to better understand that scene and ultimately how it fits in the story. So for each of these scenes, uh, we want to note the six following pieces of information. This is what we want to look for as we're going through. Uh, first, the setting, of course, and we've already pretty much determined that by the previous step, but it's good to just re-articulate it here at this point with each scene then the key characters and the key characters uh as you'll as you'll see it there's key characters in the story but then each scene may have may not have all of those key characters involved in that scene we see that in this story 
Jesus is in each part, but um, in the first scene, it's mainly with the woman. The second scene, it's mainly with the disciples. And the third scene, it's mainly with the villagers uh, who are all foils in this particular story. Again, remembering Jesus as the protagonist and that the cultural uh, prejudice being the antagonist. So we want to look for a setting of the story, uh, the scene, sorry, the key characters in the scene. Um, and when I say that, don't just identify, well, yeah, in this part, yeah, let's identify who they are. Then identify important narrator comments. Again, I want you to be paying attention to that within the scene, important dialogue within the scene. And what, by important, I mean what interaction or statements made within the scene seem to be significant. Again, this is interpretive, but it is meant to, you know, as you think about in this scene, okay, what seems to be important? And by this time, you've been, you've gone through the story, you've done the character analysis, you've done the setting analysis, you've uh, read through the story, made observations, um, you then looked at the different, identified each scene. So you're, you know, at this point, we're very familiar with the story. And so as we go back again and look, okay, what seems to be key dialogue within this scene? Um, that's what we want to note here. So it's not just repeating all the dialogue, everything that was said. It's, it's trying to pick out statements made by the key characters that seem significant. It's the same with narrator comments. You don't just put down every narrator comment, but those comments which seem to be important from your understanding of the story at this point in your study. And then uh, compose a one-line summary, like a summary sentence describing the scene what seems to be the main uh, thrust of the scene, the main point, the main uh, event or, or statement, or just what, what seems to be the point of that scene. Again, remembering each scene is like a paragraph in an epistle where there is a, a main point intended to be conveyed that um, we want to try to pick up on, and that'll be connected to the other scenes. And then finally, Again, sometimes just something sticks out as you're studying the scene in detail. And so I just noted a, a sixth um, particular thing to, to consider is just, is there any other things that come to your mind? Observations, general comments as you examine the scene. That, this always happens with me as I'm looking through and then something pops out to me that maybe I didn't see before, or maybe it, it makes more sense to me now, or or sometimes just more questions pop into my head as I'm studying the scene in detail. So, so that's it. So we look for these six elements as we go through each scene in itself. Again, just think of it like a paragraph or a stanza. We're just focusing on that particular scene, all right? The stuff we've done before kind of looked at it as a whole, the story as a whole. Uh, at this point now, we're looking at the smaller uh, chunks of the story uh, and focusing. Okay, so any questions on that? That's just a overview of what we're gonna be doing here. Okay, well, let's, let's dive in then and just start looking at, uh, let's see if I can squeeze this down a little bit. How's that? Okay, and what I'll, what I'll do is just, uh, I've just put down here, and hopefully you can see it. Uh, if not, I'll just I'll note it on this side over here on the right. Um, by each scene. So let's read. We'll just read the scene. I'll have one of you guys or two of you guys read uh, the scene, and then we will uh, discuss it. Looking for again these six elements. Okay, the setting, key characters, narrator comments important dialogue, one-line summary, and then any other observations, okay? So um, let's start with uh, Atong. If you could read for us uh, verses 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. 
So he came to a city of Samaria called Sikar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay. So again, we recognize this to be an introduction. And so here, uh, this provides the setting of the story. So we won't, it's not a typical scene. So we wouldn't do narrative analysis on this, um, on this, on these first six verses. In other words, we wouldn't do all those elements, but obviously this is the narrator, primarily speaking. So um, at this point, what I typically do, if, if I've already recognized this is just an introduction to the setting of the story, what I'll do here is just uh, kind of look at it again, if anything sticks out to me that I haven't already noticed or identified, I might take note of it here. Um, so I generally just make some observations. Anything that sticks out to you guys here that, that um, maybe didn't seem as important before or something you noticed you didn't notice before or just any general comments before we look to the next scene? I think we've discussed this in any detail, but um, Atong, since you read it, is there anything that you notice here that either seems significant or maybe something you hadn't noticed before? None, Pastor. I'm sorry? None. None? Okay. Yeah, I think we've worn this these first six verses out from our previous discussions. Uh, we recognized before the connection in verses one to three, transitioning from the previous story to this one, and even talked about uh, the significance of this in the big picture of the Gospel of John as a whole. And why Jesus might be pointing out the Pharisees, uh, you know, what, what motivated him to leave Judea to go to Galilee, that the pressure from the Pharisees potentially, and uh, so he left Judea, went into Galilee, and then, of course, the, the key comment the narrator makes here, at least it seems more important the more we look at the story, that Jesus had to pass through Samaria, we talked about that before and then we talked also about the level of detail that john gives as far as the setting he's very specific about the place right um not only is it samaria but it is near sukar a particular town or village in samaria and not only that it is near a specific parcel of ground that where jake jacob uh, gave to Joseph. And not only that, he's even more specific that he's talking about they're at Jacob's well together. So he really identifies very specifically the location. And that's important to consider in regards to why would that be significant for this specific story? And then he also is very specific about uh, the um Jesus sitting at the well okay or by the well in this case all right so I mean he's like zeroed it down to the very rock <laughs> in in the region and then he's very specific about the time right he says it's the sixth hour which um, there are debates by scholars whether the sixth hour is under the Roman time or Jewish time whether it is um, six in the morning or whether it is noon, uh, there's some debate, but I think most have agreed that it's likely the noon time, sixth hour, the first hour is 6 a.m. Uh, but, but again, the point being here is the specificity by, the, by John in regards to the time and the place. So I think we talked about that quite a bit in our previous discussions, but did anyone else wanna make any comment question or thought about this before we before we get to the first scene
All right. Well, let's dive into the second scene then. And I divided this up into a couple, a few sections to read. So I'll ask Tabs uh, for you to read verses 7 to 12. And then, um, Jason, if you could read uh, verses 13 to 19. And then, uh, Renee, if you could read verses 20 to 26. All right. This is all part of scene one of this story. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Uh, verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, uh, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Okay, um, where will I stop, Pastor Tim? Renee, if you want to read verse 20 to 26. Yes, Pastor Tim. <clears throat> Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the, an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, um, we'll start with you, Tabs since you uh, read first is uh, I'll give you the easy one though, since I know your, your, your brain is tired from all your classes, but uh, setting, what's the setting of this scene? And this is where just, just state it kind of in a summary fashion, short. Uh, that's where the setting is uh, by the well and uh, Jesus is uh, there and the Samaritan woman came in. They, and then he asked her for a drink of water, and then they have the dialogue. All right, and the, yeah, the a woman meets him there. Uh, it's at noon. And, uh, at noon, and uh, the, the disciples were not there. They went yeah. to buy food. Disciples in town for food. Okay, yeah, good, something like that. Just a sort of a quick summary. 
All right, and uh, that will give you a second one's easy to tap. So characters. Who are the char key characters in in this scene? The woman and the Samaritan woman and Jesus Christ. Now, the disciples are mentioned in this uh, or scene in verse eight. Uh, why would we not call them key characters? Um, because they were not the only people who were interacting or having a dialogue where Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Yeah, they're key characters in the whole story, and they'll show up later. But in this scene, even though they're mentioned, they're not key to the scene. Okay, so we're just focusing on those who are key to the scene, right? That's why we only mention Jesus and the Samaritan woman, not Samaritans, okay? Just want to clarify that. All right, now, um, Jason, we'll uh, give you the sec start us off. I want everyone to contribute, but we'll start with Jason here. Key dialogue, Jason, anything in this scene that's said by either Jesus or the woman that seems important or significant for this scene? As or in uh, verse 7 to uh, verse 15. Yeah. Uh, the, the dialogue about the water. And yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Stop it. Uh, in verse 15, uh, verse 16. I think and until uh, 19. It's a dialogue about uh, about the relationship of the woman, something talking about the husband or his her lifestyle, I mean. Okay, good. And in verse 20 till the end, uh, verse 26, the dialogue about, uh, about worship. Yes, good. Yeah, that's kind of how I looked at this scene. There seemed to be sort of three, three uh, topics or uh, three focuses, three foci focuses in this. The first was the living water and um, and drinking living water, and then the second was the the woman's personal life, and then the third was yeah this discussion about worship. So good. Okay, any are there any statements made specific statements within that? So I think that's a good breakdown of the course of the dialogue. Any specific statements, Jason, within that that stick out to you or seem important in this scene? Uh, the verse, uh, verse 14, Pastor. Okay. Uh, the dialogue that uh, speaks about uh, Jesus giving the living water. Okay, in verse uh, 14. Verse 14. Yeah, he, he, he just, Jesus, uh, Jesus claims to have water, living water that uh, gives eternal life. Can we say it that way? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, that's a pretty significant statement, right? Really, <laughs> just in all the Bible, right? That's a pretty significant statement. I can give you something that will give you eternal life. Mm. Okay, good. Anybody else want to... Uh, chime in or add something at this point. Specific statements within this scene that that you find important. Pastor, if I may add the response of the woman in verse 15, uh, the desire to have uh, that water. When, he men when she mentioned, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way to you. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. D 
there seems to be a she doesn't quite understand at this point but there does seem to be a uh, you know a desire an interest on her for uh, from, from her on this so that that's significant because that leads to right as the story progresses she shows more and more of an interest or desire that eventually she becomes an evangelist herself <laughs> um just a little bit later good any anyone anybody else any again we're just looking at uh, we're looking at the the first scene which is a pretty big one verses 7 through 26 here i think um verse verse 10 is to, uh, sufficiently significant too because here the Lord was already about to introduce and change the direction of the conversation in verse 10 yeah <clears throat> yeah what what's what is uh, what did Jesus say here specifically that that you find? Um, he, he was basically already about to, he just made reference to, to living water. Yes. And, and this changes the whole direction of the conversation. Yeah. He transitions so, rather rapidly, doesn't he, to spiritual matters, yeah. which he often does, right? I mean, he did it with, in John three. You know, you must be born again. If you want to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You know, he sort of just opened up the dialogue with that one. <laughs> it's like, when's the last time you started a conversation that way? But yeah, he he moves from a, you know, a real circumstance uh, that's in front of them to a spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual uh, truth. Anyone else see anything in this first uh, scene that seems? What about just following uh, Jason's sort of structure that he pointed out? What about verses 16 to 19? Anything said there that we would see as maybe important in this story? Obviously, the well, I'll hold that comment for a minute. Manny, anything there that sticks out to you? Or in the Pastor team. Scene. Good morning, Pastor Tim. Good morning. Pastor Tim, it strikes me that. Uh, Jesus seems to have planned, planned the course of the conversation and how he opened it. He opened it by, by uh, he opened the conversation by uh, saying, give me a drink for the water, which, could, which would transition into something spiritual later. And then also his statement in verse 16 about his command to call the husband. I think also it's, it, it seems to me like a pre-plan to open again spiritual things regarding the personal life of the woman. 
Yeah, which I found verse 16, I would call that an important statement just in the in that sense that it it, it really seems to be um at first at first this this is a might seem to be an odd question just as you think about the dialogue right we have a saying here in the states right that came out of left field like that mm. came from yeah. from like wh wh yeah. where did that it's like yes. where did that come from mm. right he has her right where he wants her right sir i want this water now i think if we were speaking we might have said, oh, okay, let me, I'm going to explain to her what this water is. She's, you know, she bit, she, she's interested. Mm. She doesn't understand, but right. I mean, wouldn't you, I think that would be the, the normal response is like, okay, she's interested. I'm going to tell her now what this water is, but he, he sort of does a total misdirection. It seems at first by, by asking about her personal life. Right. I mean, that, I don't know, but that really struck me as, as odd, <clears throat> as an odd way to, it's almost like you're going to put a damper on this, Jesus. She's interested. You've got her. Just tell her what the living water is. And then you're going to bring up that. I mean, she's going to, you know, you're probably, she's probably going to be offended or, or lie or, you know, or uh, this is going to totally make her disinterested in the gospel, you would think. So I, I found first 16 as an awkward, obviously Jesus is the wisest man who ever lived. So he knew what he was doing, but um, anyway, that that's why verse 16, I thought was an important statement by mm -hmm. Jesus because it was so um, seemingly disconnected to the flow of thought. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or thoughts about that or about the scene or verses 16 and 19? Uh, yes, Brother Robbie. Raleigh, did you uh, have something? Can you hear me? Not quite. Can you guys hear him? Or is that you, Ants? I want to say, I can't hear him, but I, I just want to say, Pastor, how, how uh, the woman had, had um, in a way, progressed in the way that um, she knew christ at first as a man he he he, he referred to him you're a man and i'm a woman and you're talking you're a jew and i'm a samaritan and then eventually um i perceive you're a prophet in verse um, 19 and then uh, later on um uh, she uh, referred to the messiah that uh, eventually the lord jesus would disclose uh, himself uh, to her yeah verse 19 being yeah a significant statement right she she calls him uh then she calls prophet. him uh, a prophet and then of course understands later that he's the messiah i think that's an important statement in the story the recognition of who jesus is first by the samaritan woman and then later we'll see that with the uh with the samaritan village all right good you guys anything else in this first scene that statements made that um Are we still in verses 16 to 19, or are we looking at the whole first scene now? 
Yeah, either either one. Uh, okay. The whole scene, but if there's some, yeah, any any part of it that sticks out. Yeah. Oh, verses 23, 24, and really verse 24, where uh, the Lord now basically makes a theological statement no, uh, about God and how he must be worshipped. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we discussed this before just about the how significant this statement is and to whom it was it was given, right? Um that Jesus would tell this particular Samaritan woman probably one of the more profound statements on worship in scripture. Um that she would be the recipient of it. That's really am quite amazing and then you got to ask you know what would john be doing here by including this part of the dialogue on this topic in the story again we're always asking the question why what's the connection is there significance here sometimes there isn't it's just part of a the story that the author develops, but but often, especially you got to think, guys, something this theologically significant wasn't just John filling in, you know, the story for drama's sake. Um, there's a point here, and I know often when people preach on worship, they use this passage, and rightly so. I mean, there's much that it has to say, much Jesus had to say about worship here. But often this passage is taken out and focused on in itself, not as part of the story overall. And um, I understand that because, again, I know there's, there's, there's some deep doctrinal truths here that would be, you could spend a whole, you know, you can spend several messages really on, <laughs> on what Jesus says here. But we first want to understand it in in light of the story. Now think about this story. Is there anything Jesus says here that could be, at, the, at least at this stage in our study, could seem to be uh, uh, connected to the story or significant in regards to the story? Any ideas? Um, I think the Lord uh, was really setting up, um, correcting the the division between the Samaritans here in chapter four, and then um, the Jews um, in in chapter three and and chapter five was setting up. Um, destroying that division by describing by basically saying that both uh, in in one sense uh the samaritans were wrong with regard to the place but the jews also were wrong with regard to how they thought they were worshiping god and um i, I see that this statement here especially in verse 24 um the Lord was now setting up a foundational theological truth for true worship, which no one there at that point was doing. Yeah, that's a good a good point. Um, because if you think about it again in the story, what is the problem? What do you guys remember to be? What's the problem or the the of the story we're you know jumping ahead to plot but 
Um, the because we talked about antagonists. What's the problem in this story? The, the culture. culture. Cultural yeah. prejudice. And what would that prejudice, right? It's between, you know, Jew and Samaritan. What would that prejudice limit or prevent in this situation? So I think with regard to the story that we're looking at, I think the verses 20 to 22 where where Jesus talks about, uh, where the woman talks about the place of worship. And I think the prejudice would prevent them from worshiping together in the same place. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the prejudice, uh, prejudice would prevent, um, I don't know how to say, mutual worship or... or or uh, worshiping together. Um, that prejudicial attitude, how, how would that affect um, basically spreading the message or the word or how, how would that influence that aspect? I think the Lord here was... Um about to um, address the issue of the message being open to all, not just the Jews, and uh, in addressing that prejudice. Yeah, this is where I would see verse 23 as being significant. Mm -hmm. two, two things here. So not only was there deep um, theological truth revealed that of what true worship is, but also that God seeks those to offer this worship, right? So the message, you know, that it's open to all and the Father seeks true worshipers. What do we see happening in this story? What's Jesus doing in this story? I mean, just overall, step back. Just think about the general, the general events in this story. Jesus shares the gospel, essentially, or reveals his identity as Messiah to the Samaritans in this village. Right? That's sort of the, what happens, yeah, here, right? Yeah. And they believe. Right? If you were to summarize this story as far as from an event level jesus basically um evangelizes the Gentiles. evangelizes the samaritan village yeah okay now what what's behind this why is that significant why would john include it right that's what we want to ask ourselves and then as we think about that then looking at these statements in the story, this one sticks out to me, guys. The Father seeks. Such people, the Father seeks to be. What's Jesus doing here? He is. He, I think, Pastor, that he's just, this, um, what's this? He's showing us that he's seeking because he sought the woman out. Yes. He is the, can we say it this way, emissary on behalf of the Father, seeking the lost. Why? To, to reveal to them who he is, what he has done, what they need to do so that they may become true worshipers, right? The Father seeks true worshipers. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. I think that's that statement's significant. And I think that's why John includes it in the story. Because here we're given an example, exactly that very truth. That 
as Robbie, as you just said, you know, the, the Samaritans were, were, their worship was inadequate because they didn't worship, you know, God, they didn't understand God rightly. The Jews, their worship was inadequate because they, you know, they had added on to what God desired. They didn't worship him in truth or in spirit. The Samaritans didn't worship him in truth. And so not only is Jesus pointing that out here, but, but he's also demonstrating by his very actions what he said in verse 23. You guys see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, see, you see how how this part of the dialogue in the story connects to mm -hmm. the story. And with John, again, um, I think one of the secrets, so to speak, in studying John is to pay attention to certain words. Okay, we already know some what might some of those words be if you see them in the story, in any story in the gospel. Think about John's purpose statement of the book. Yeah, belief, faith in faith in God. Okay, so yeah, definitely right when you see, um, let me just believe. Okay, pistuo, believe, right? Because John wrote this gospel so that the reader would believe. So whenever you, in going through the accounts, when you see believe, that's an important term in the gospel. What else? Worship. Okay, worship in this particular story, uh, I don't think he uses the word, I think it's proskuneo if I remember right. I don't think he uses that word anywhere else in the gospel, but it is connected to the idea of believing, right? It would be a manifestation of that. So in this story, worship would be one connection potentially. But what else? Look at the purpose statement in verses 30 and yeah. 31. And we say, Pastor, uh, the word sent. Yes. Stole my thunder. I was going to share that later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let, let's come back to that. And then, Jason, you can expound on it. I'll let you take the glory. All right. But before we talk about sent, <laughs> what about um, verses 30 and 31? Those present to us a few key words that we want to pay attention to in John's gospel. One is believe or believing. What other ones? Uh, life, pastor. Yeah, life, uh, particularly eternal life. He mentions that quite often in the gospel. That's an important one. And what is what comes up in this story, right? Living water that springs up to eternal yes. life. And then later in the story, it mentions believe as well. Okay, what else? What other word? Um, Jesus is the Christ. Um, yes. The Christ. And then with that, the Son of God as well. When it points to his deity or his uh, humanity, specifically as Messiah. And what do we see in this story? Right? We see reference to Jesus. He's... Uh, the woman says, I perceive you're the Messiah. And then Jesus said, I am the Messiah. Any other? Savior of the world. Yes. Uh, so we put that, yeah, Savior, uh, Jesus or Savior. And then uh, signs, okay? That's mentioned in verse 30. <laughs> particular so these are these are ones we know from the purpose statement of the book now as you go through the book we also find another very important term from john that you will find in several stories it's even in the first one uh, in the beginning the word sent that jesus was sent 
Um, also, the word seek, they're, they're linked. If you have a story in John which contains any of these words, those are significant. And uh, I want to say, in most mm. every story, there's either these words expressed or a, a connection to them in just about every story in the gospel of John. And in this particular story, we see a number of these <coughs> that are mentioned. But notice here in verse 23 of John 4, we have the father seeks. And then we have, of course, Jesus being representative uh, you know, for the father seeking, that's what he's doing in the story. And then notice something I'm, I'm skipping ahead to the next scene, but I've got to do it right now. Notice one of the questions that John, the narrator poses as something the disciples could have been thinking. What do you seek? I don't think that's an accident. That could be a common sort of idiom in the culture, but that's an interesting that he chose that particular question. It's ironic, really. Because he is seeking, yeah. actually. <laughs> and then, of course, later, uh, when he's in the, next, in the mm -hmm. second scene, he talks about, I sent you, um, him who sent me. Okay, so... If we know ahead of time, these are these are words that we want to pay attention to. Because John often frames his stories around these words. Mm -hmm. To essentially. Uh, um, fulfill or, or fit or meet the purpose for the book. OK, so again, this I'm bringing all this up because. I, I want, you know, it's important that we are thinking as we go through each scene, and in particular in this part, we're looking at dialogue. How might this dialogue be connected to the story? That's, it might make it, it might show it to be significant. And at first, you look at this statement on worship that Jesus makes. And, and um, again, the temptation is you just, we take that out and we focus on it and build a, a sermon series on worship, which is perfectly fine. But we don't want to miss how it fits here in this story. And I think it's rather significant. And it helps to reinforce or reveal what John is doing in this story. And if you think about of the other Gospels, too, I mean, Jesus was mission-oriented, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. How many times, I think Luke's gospel, Luke points this out thematically. He uses a word called day in Greek, which means it's the idea of um, um, just write it down. Uh, in Luke, Luke conveys this with the Greek word day, which is has the idea of not, not deo, but day, which has the idea of it must be, it is necessary. Uh, it has to, oh, in fact, you know what? Here, let me just show you in, let's see, where is it here? Not that one, not that one. There we go. Um, there he goes. Open it up to Greek stuff again. What's going on here? Well, we have a Greek scholar in the in the being born, so he can explain this to us. But if I go back to verse four, I'm just spitballing it here. Yep, it is there. Verse four. It's a form of the word. Uh, I don't know if you can see on the bottom here. Maybe I'll do it this way. This is a form of the word day. D. Delta Epsilon Iota, D-E-I. All right, now if I do a, just a quick 
today, uh, let's see if any of these, uh, is necessary, has need of, inevitable. Um, it is necessary. It is a must. It's this idea of being compelled. Mm. Like if, right. if you were telling your kid, you have to do this. Uh, if you were speaking in Greek, you would use probably some form of the word day. Now, that word appears quite often in Luke, but it's even here in this gospel in, in verse 4, when Jesus, when the narrator says mm -hmm. it was necessary or Jesus had to go through That's Samaria. Yeah. And it conveys this idea of being compelled because he's on a mission. Mm -hmm. And that missional element is um, uh, seen by Jesus throughout the Gospels, uh, particularly, like I said, in Luke, right? That's where we have the famous declaration he made, I came to seek and save, seek and save the lost, right? Mm -hmm. um, keep, keep an eye on that in Luke's Gospel. Look for statements like it is necessary or I must or something like that. But again, we do see that here in john's gospel as well just in that you know apparent side comment <laughs> in verse four that the more and more we look at the story i think the more and more significant that statement becomes in regards to the point of the story so i'm i'm going down this path of discussion because of how i like i said i often see verses 21 or 20 to 24 how they're often treated and um don't really hear a lot about how they fit in the story from sermons i've heard and i, I think it's it it powerfully uh when you understand this this the whole story and i think it's a powerful um it gives some very helpful insight into what John is doing in this story. Here, Jesus is ex explaining to the Samaritan woman that the Father seeks true worshipers. And we could add in this story, and he, Rob even pointed out, true worshipers, whether they're Jew or Gentile or, or, or Jew or Samaritan or even Gentile. Yeah, thoughts? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Agree, disagree, questions? Yeah, it, it, it's, um, uh, I, I, I would agree with you that it is really important. Um, and it strikes me in a fresh way now, that last part of verse 23, for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. And the Lord, the Lord, I think here was about to set up what he was going to say to the disciples in terms of to whom he was going to be sending them eventually. And here, the Lord's coming here to, to the Sukkar was, was really just manifesting that truth that the Father seeks seeking true worshipers yeah that's why he had to go to samaria yeah and that's why when commentators i read you know they say well he, he just went through samaria because it was the shortest route and he was urgently wanting to go to galilee i'm like well okay what? maybe but that's reading into the story but here we have from the story i think a compelling argument as to what it meant that he had to go through Samaria. Because he had, there were souls there that the father wanted him to seek. He'd been sent to seek and save the lost. And so whatever tribe, tongue, people, or nation they came from. And this is why I think this story is an appropriate one to for two things. One, again, I'm jumping ahead here, but one is as we think about the Great Commission, this is a Great Commission text. 
and particularly the Great Commission to those that we really don't want to make disciples. The Taliban, ISIS, that, wow. yeah, that neighbor that we can't stand, <laughs> that family member that's antagonistic, you know, I think there's direct application here to those kinds of situations. Um, just in the sense of our heart, you know, it's, I'm not saying use this to, you know, to make people obligated to go to Afghanistan right now or something like that. But just in terms of the attitude, we have a prejudice against Muslims or can be tempted to. I mean, I think just because of how they've treated our fellow believers, certainly um, some of that might be justified as far as our concerns, but uh, Anyway, this is something to chew on that for a little bit. Just think about it. But um, okay. Anyway, where are we at time wise? Okay. Um, I don't know anything else in these verses that, as far as this first scene, that that you guys want to? Oh, of course, verse one. Of course, verse twenty six. Hmm. Um, oh right, right. This, this, for me, this is really the amazing. For me, this is an amazing verse in this whole discussion because the Lord here just outrightly identifies Himself to this Samaritan woman. Yeah, and how often does He do that? In the, you know, if you think about in the Gospels, where he does something, where he makes a direct a direct, uh, you know, makes a declaration like that. So yeah, we'd want to put verse 26. At times, he even seems to not focus on that or point that out. You know, sometimes in regards to not wanting to stir up the Jews to try to make him king or, right? He's guarded about making this kind of statement at times. But here, he's very direct and plainly tells her. Sorry about that. All right. Well, let's let's move into the next scene. Unless there's any more comment or questions or thoughts, Manny, anything? What are you thinking? <gasps> Pastor Tim, uh, regarding what we you have already uh, what we have already seen in the past. Because uh, verse 26 is significant, and its significance is connected to verse 25 also regarding the audience, because it is in verse 25 where the narrator translates the word Messiah into Christ. So it tells us something about the audience and also the messianic expectations. Uh, yeah, during that time it was written yeah good which we um we, we can point out in the translator comments here in a moment yeah that's a very key statement you're right okay good any other comments before we uh, look at the next part of the scene analysis here
for this scene. I guess actually Manny just sort of maybe went ahead and transitioned us in the next scene. Key narrator comments. Um, verse 25 is one. Give me a second, guys. I got to go get some more Kleenex, all right? I'll be right back. Allergies are still strong. I'll be right back. But um, go ahead and review that. Look through the verses again. Look for key, key narrator comments, okay? Give me one second. I'll be right back. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> All right. So uh, now we want to identify what seem to be significant statements by the narrator. And uh, Manny pointed one out here where the narrator uh, translates Christ for the reader, right? He wants to make sure, wants to make sure uh, we understand uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. The anointed one. All right, good. Any other narrator comments just in this scene that I think somebody mentioned someone mentioned one earlier. Renee, you got you got one? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Pastor Tim. But uh on verses uh eight and nine, there are two parenthetical statements given by the narrator. Verses eight and nine. Okay. Uh, stating that uh, just a, a sort uh, like a background that Jesus is alone and his disciples had gone into the town. In verse nine, the author mentioned uh, the prejudice, for the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Yeah, he explains the, the woman's statement, right? Yes. By um, revealing the cultural prejudice. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that that is a key. And then after that, honestly, there's just not a lot of uh, narrator comments here, right? The rest of the most of this scene is dialogue between Jesus and the woman. But there's those few. Uh, and the New American Standard puts them in parentheses. And I think rightly, there's those few little comments by the narrator 
just to, uh, you know, it's like he's making sure we aren't missing certain key features in this story, right? So I think that's all I picked up. Did anyone else see anything from the narrator that seems significant? All right, how about the, as we think about it, the, what the, how would you summarize this story in a, in a sentence? <coughs> uh, sorry, this scene in a sentence. <gasps> Tabs, why don't you give it a try? How would you summarize this scene? Um, Jesus shares the gospel. <laughs> okay, that's that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> now, all right, give it a little more detail. Detail in terms of the scene, Pastor, of what we yeah. just talked about and everything. Yeah, in terms of the scene. Ah, okay. Um, I think the point of the scene would be generally Jesus shares the gospel, but uh, the point would be uh, it, Jesus was very deliberate in his seeking of the woman and how he led the conversation from from the beginning of uh, the issue of drinking water to living water and then leading the woman to realize her sinful state and then revealing who he is as the messiah okay All right, anyone else want to either modify that, add to it, ridicule it? That's fine too. <laughs> Tabs can take it. When you think about, it's kind of like with summarizing a paragraph, you know, when we, when we do that literary context and you're trying to summarize, you know, how do you capture sort of the idea of the paragraph? That's what we're trying to do here. So if, if we were to say Jesus talks to the Samaritan or shares a gospel to the Samaritan woman, that's, that's too general. Okay. Yeah, that happened here. Now, or if you said something like Jesus, Jesus, uh, uh, breaks through cultural barriers to seek out sinners, that might be too interpretive at this point. Again, we're looking at the author, what he's doing in regards to the story, okay? So you, you, you kind of want to be somewhere between. You don't want to be too general. You don't want to be too interpretive, but you do want to try to reflect what seems to be the the idea here what you know what's the author doing here in this particular scene um so any, anybody want to take another how about how about um jesus points out the the truth that god is seeking true worshipers Okay. In coming okay. In, in coming into contact with um, the Samaritan woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
sometimes this is the hardest part of the, it is. Of the process. It is. Yeah. Pastor Tim, are you referring to the point of the scene in terms of the author's perspective? Yeah, you're, you're trying to capture, okay, the events of the scene and also what the author seems to be doing in the scene, okay? So uh, okay. it is tricky. It is difficult. But I think forcing yourself, it's like in the, par in the epistles, forcing yourself to summarize and try to distill it mm -hmm. actually is a helpful exercise. Because then you really think, okay, what, what seems to be important here? and what, what is, how would this scene maybe connect to the story? What's he doing? Now, certainly seeking out the woman to reveal his identity as Messiah seems to be the, the, the idea but also we're trying to incorporate what is revealed in the story. So as Pastor Robbie did, you know, with seeks true worshipers. So he's trying to incorporate that idea. And again, like the paragraph summaries, there's not necessarily one exact answer. I mean, it's just, we might include more or less, you know, than the next person, but we're just trying to do our best to sort of capture what we see are key elements here so with that anybody want to <gasps> what if um <laughs> the tong you be... have any? oh sorry robbie go ahead no it's okay um that's canton Atong, do you have any uh, opinion here? I want to express an idea or thought. Uh, probably, Pastor, the the sowing of the gospel to the heart of the Samaritan woman. The solving is that what you said? Yes, the sowing, Pastor. Oh, sowing. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Sowing of of the gospel. Uh, they say in the heart of the Samaritan, in this case, woman, right? Because that's who he's talking to. Okay. Yeah, clearly, right? He's seeking her out to essentially, we would say, evangelize her, right? That's definitely would be a part. And even in what he says, right? He talks about living water, you know, go back to how Jason sort of, uh, saw the structure of this particular scene of the living water um the true worshipers uh pointing out her particular sin so maybe uh, let me try this jesus seeks um seeks out Samaritan woman to reveal that he is the Messiah who gives living water um, um, say unto or that brings eternal life, something like that. That will do. <laughs> something like that. Now, if we want to throw in the comment about true worshipers that you know that's fine you know there's an art to this so you want to have enough information that captures the scene but you know yes. how much detail that's always a, a challenge but i as i said before i think if you can get it into 10 to 20 words that's probably a good general mm -hmm. target so i don't know how many this is three six nine twelve fifteen eighteen twenty twenty words Woo look at that oh man this guy is good. All right. <laughs> That's just a rule of thumb. There's no law or, you know, command on this, but um, something like that. So can you see from what we talked about how we, how at least mm -hmm. I got to this one, there's probably better ways to say this for sure, but just kind of the 
what we're looking for. And then finally, I guess we're out of time here. Then we just want to note if there's any other comments or things that stick out. Um, you know, again, I think asking the question, what what links these um, three topics mm -hmm. together in this scene? That's a key question, right? The three topics that um, Jason pointed out, and uh, you know how how do they how do they fit in the whole story? I think those are two important questions that just came in my mind as I'm thinking about, especially that true worship section. And then we talked about that <clears throat> a little bit, but maybe initially, right, you don't see all of that, but it just might. I know when I first studied this story, that was a big question in my mind that I really didn't get till I studied the next scene, actually, in detail. I was like, what, what is this? true worship discussion, how does that fit in the story? It didn't quite connect with me until I looked at what Jesus said in the next scene. Any other observations or just comments as, as we were going through? Something you would note? What's your team? Yeah. Uh, I, I can't help but really uh, also compare chapter four with chapter three. Um, how um, Jesus, in a way, um, manifested himself not just to a religious person, um, Nicodemus, and then uh, had talked about God's love for God so loved the world, and then to a Samaritan woman who is really um, in the eyes of society or the world, she's sinful and she is far from um, someone who uh, receives certain revelation concerning God. But the thing happened is that um, she was the one indeed who, who got the, the wonderful revelation of who God is. God is spirit and that God uh, seeks worshipers. So um, I'm just so amazed at how, how the Lord just um, brings that um, to, to, to light and how he reveals himself um, to people. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, that's good. Um, just to be thinking about sort of bigger picture, right? And some of the links of this story to others and and even just two yeah nicodemus didn't get it at least not at that point but she did and uh quite amazing like you said Ants, you know that nicodemus was the at the top level both you know culturally academically intellectually you know every capacity compared to this woman and yet he walked away puzzled. She walked away with salvation. And I think um, maybe something to think about, guys, as we close our time today. Um, just in this particular story, um, you know, obviously Jesus is evangelizing we would say reaching out to this seeking this particular woman for on behalf of the father in order to you know move her to faith um and i think you know i when we look at things like this stories like this um you know is this a story that we should use to teach people how to share the gospel What if somebody took this message and, or took this story and made it a message about how you approach people to share the gospel? What do you think of that? Uh, 
I think it's I think it's possible um, to use a similar uh, um, approach um, in terms of um, by first uh, helping the person identify what do you need, what do you think you're looking for. Just like this woman was looking for that kind of water where, where she would not need to keep on going back to the well. And um, as, as you begin to uh, present Christ as the answer, um, you will have to make clear first um, the reason for the real reason for why any person would need Christ, and and that that's where the uh, identifying or the or or the mentioning of the fact that we are all sinners comes in. That's what the Lord does when he when he tells the woman to bring her husband to help her identify that. She was in she was in sin. Um, and then uh, just following the flow of the story, um, you can now basically present the fact that uh, the kind of people that God seeks are those who are really um, desiring to know the truth and not willing and, and are willing to come before God not on his own terms but on God's terms in, in some way you could use I think I think you could use whatever pattern the uh, this story has in sharing the gospel yeah this is something I want to I want to come back to. I think because um, time doesn't permit us today to maybe talk about this, but maybe thoroughly, but keep that in mind as we as we go forward. Because um, I've seen this story used and elements of it used to sort of give us a prescription for how we share the gospel. And I want to I think it's important we talk about that. You know, we discussed the principle of, of narratives, the hermeneutic principle of right prescriptive versus descriptive. Um, so there's that to consider. There's also the fact to consider Jesus as a perfect example of everything. So whatever he does is a pattern for us. And then the question of what does the author intend for us to see here? So those are just some elements I want you to think about. Because we can um, sometimes uh, maybe right, rightly apply a story, though we wrongly interpret it, or rightly mm. interpret it, but wrongly apply. <laughs> so um, anyway, just uh, like I said, we don't have time to delve deep into this question, but I thought I'd just throw it out there and have you think about it a little bit, and then we'll... We'll bring it up late, you know, it's maybe next week or the week mm -hmm. after, just come back to that and just be thinking about, okay, you know, what, what's appropriate to glean from this account, you know, in, you know, what topics or aspects of the story are appropriate to, to use or bring up or teach. So mm. it really goes to the challenge of narratives as a whole, but especially narratives about the Lord. Because uh, if we have a narrative about, you know, some human character, then besides Jesus, then it's, you know, be very careful. But when it's Jesus um, and what he says or does, of course, he never sinned. Uh, so, I mean, is it different? You know, how we approach stories about Jesus and what we apply and what he does or says versus mm -hmm. others. So. Let me just throw that out there as a thing to think about and um, come back to it. All right. Okay. Well, we made it through one scene. <laughs> we'll see 
how we do next week. But again, uh, we're not, at least I'm not on any, you know, uh, goal to have to finish by a certain time. I really want to just glean out, draw out everything we can just to, to consider, you know, um, as we look at narratives, as with any passage of scripture, just what should we look for? What do we draw out? What's appropriate to, how do we think about, and then with stories, we think about it in the sense of, again, narrator, dialogue, scenes, all these things um, play a part in that. So I'll let you go for lunch, but uh, any final comments or questions before we depart? I'm probably hungry. We've already dropped a few guys off there. <laughs> um on a personal note robbie how how is uh louis family doing um just change gears a little um, 